Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the channel. I am Stylosa. Now, in this video, we are going to cover possible Winter Wonderland skins that have been leaked on the Blizzard Gear Store. Also, as well, um, the Blizzard Gear Store kind of put up an image for Diablo Reign of Terror. Could that be the name of the next game? Anyway, I digress, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, also, as well, we're going to discuss the idea of new interactions. Could this lead to possible new bits of lore and all that kind of good stuff? There's a fantastic video, which I'm going to link to in this video's description. You guys go and check it out. It shows you all of the 40-plus interactions that have been added with this event. Um, and ranked is fixed, ladies and gentlemen, because you, you can't select Torb. <laughs> anyway, let's get stuck into this. So this image was sent to me by two guys on Twitter, pretty much um, around about the same time, I believe. So Oriel Games sent me this, um, saying, hey, Sty, check this out. And also, as well, it was sent to me by Wyoming Mist. Now, this is an image of a piece of merch you can buy if you have got the BlizzCon virtual ticket. Now, the way this works is when you get the virtual ticket, you get a code. You apply the code to your Blizzard account, and then you can access the early sort of pre-order stuff for Blizzard merchandise. So... When you get to BlizzCon, there is a massive, and I mean absolutely massive, hall which is dedicated to just selling merchandise. Now, if you're you're lucky enough to be going to BlizzCon, um, so if you've bought a BlizzCon ticket, you get the virtual ticket as well. It's just part of the ticket. Now, obviously, it's, it's extremely difficult to get a BlizzCon ticket, but if you've got one, then you can pre-order this stuff, go to the event and pick it up, or you can buy it and have it delivered to your house. Anyway, if you've just got a virtual ticket, you can just go on the website and basically buy this stuff and it'll be dispatched to you uh, at a later date but it shows you the new stuff and the one thing which stands out is this it's the omnic cracker t-shirt now if we look at this very closely you'll see there are two characters here behind zen now obviously that's zen's nutcracker skin we all know that it's, it's like an amazing skin it's one of the best skins in the game let's be real it's, especially when you've got golden nuts as well it's just beautiful um anyway on the left We've got Ballerina Widowmaker, probably. Remember, Widowmaker is a ballerina. That's what she did before she turned into Widowmaker and became an international murderous killer assassin for Talon who d identifies with spiders and just d d doesn't breathe, I think. Anyway, whatever, Widow Law. Uh, that's probably a new sort of skin for Widow. Then on the right-hand side, and this is the one that interests me the most because you guys know I love a bit of Junkrat, that is Junkrat, but it looks like the Mouse King. Again, this is from the Nutcracker. So it looks like Mouse King... Junkrat and Ballerina Widow. Woo! Could be skins that we get for Winter Wonderland. Now, of course, these could be nothing. This could just be a nice t-shirt, right? It could They could be sprays. Who knows? But it, it might be a little teaser. Normally, Blizzard ties stuff in, don't they? You know, if they're working on bits and pieces, it's a very complex company, if you think about it. Loads of different bits and pieces are all having to work together. Kind of like the Diablo thing I touched on at the start of this video. Everybody's kind of expecting a new Diablo game at BlizzCon, but what's it going to be called? What you know, what is it? But then when the store updated and there was an item called Diablo Reign of Terror and it was like a poster and then it, I think it was removed, it's like, yeah, hmm. little things do seep through the cracks, ladies and gentlemen. So I think this probably is going to be an indicator of new skins we're going to get with the Winter Wonderland event. Uh, now, onto all these new interactions. Now, every time there's a major update to Overwatch, so when an event rolls out, a lot of new interactions get added. The thing is, we don't really know what these interactions are, and it's a very lapsadaisy way of trying to deliver the lore, because you don't, you know, you're not able to just go, oh, what are all the new interactions? Just show me game. It doesn't do that. However, there is a YouTube channel which does specialize in Overwatch interactions. The link to their video is in the description of this video. Um, go and watch that. It's about five or six minutes long, and it shows you all of the new interactions. So this is when a character says something and another character responds. Now, often this might only happen on certain maps. So this McCree will only say certain things on Route 66 to other people, um, or it requires various combinations of heroes. So if you've got Farrah and Brigitte together, they'll now say a bunch of new lines. However, there are two lines which really interest me. This is Sombra. Well, I'm not going to play the line, but like I said, go and click the link in the description. Um, but I'll just summarize what the line is. It's Sombra saying that she feels sorry for Reinhardt after the way Overwatch have treated him. And now Sombra doesn't feel sorry for anybody. So something devastating has happened to Reinhardt. Question is, what is that? And is that going to be some sort of new lore, some sort of new like storyline, which is going to get pushed forward? Because Overwatch doesn't really have any storylines. So, I mean, I'm hoping that BlizzCon fixes this <laughs> and there's like loads of new lore and loads of new stuff comes out and that'll be awesome. But it is funky, isn't it? That Sombra would be kind of like feeling sorry for Reinhardt. Uh, the other line, which is interesting, again, I'll summarize this. It's Farah talking about her dad saying that she's off to visit him. 
Now, we know her dad lives in Canada. So could that be another storyline which starts to form? She's off to visit, visit a dad for Christmas, she says. Uh, I, that could be awesome. Where could that go? Who really knows, ladies and gentlemen? But like I said, go and check this video out. It's really, really good. There's loads of new interactions. Check it out. Yeah, and a bit of a joke. Ranked is fixed, right? Because Tor was not playable. Uh, but ranked is, is ranked, right? This is a whole massive debate. A lot of people have recently been calling for roll queue again. This is something which comes back. Now, remember, um, we know that if you guys watch some of the interviews I put on the channel from when I went to Korea, um, some of the devs that we interviewed there, they did actually speak about this system of um, sort of crawling, walking, and then running. And the current state of LFG in the game and the way we form groups is the crawl phase. So we are going to get to the walking phase at some point. Question is, will the walking be at BlizzCon? And will that be, hey, you can pick your role? Because ranked is, a, ranked is just like... I love Overwatch and I play it for hours and hours every day. And I thought that my playtime was actually declining. And you know what? It's not. On the Absolute Unit account, I've got about 80 hours, I think. Actually, I might be exaggerating. I don't know that. No, no, no. That one's not 80. That one's about 40 hours. I've got another account of uh, 18 hours. I think this is where I'm getting confused. Yeah. And then another account, which I never, ever speak about. But that, that's my highest rated one. That, that sort of floats around high master um, and GM. Uh, anyway, Absolute Unit. It's kind of like, it's just, it's an account that I go on to play. I go to play to win. But I'm playing roles that I typically don't play, but obviously I'm still trying, right? Because it's still competitive. But I'm going into a game and I'm like, hey, I'm going to try, uh, I don't know, Farah, for example. I go in on Farah and then it's like, well, um, we've got five DPS, so I've, I've got to play tank or I've got to play support. But that's kind of not what I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to play different heroes, but I don't get to do that. This is because we don't have any kind of system of allowing us to select what hero or what role we want to play. The big issue with Overwatch is you will swap your role in some games. So what, what what's the answer to this? One tank, one support, and then everybody's flex, but then you get the same situation, right? C can you possibly win a game with one tank, one support, and, and four DPS? Yeah, you've got more of a chance than if you've got six DPS, right? But hey, it, it's, it's a massive issue. So I don't know. Like right now, I'm feeling like... My attitude to Overwatch competitive is starting to change. I do play it to win, but I am going out there. It's it's the age old thing, right? Of rank doesn't matter. It, it doesn't, but I before you would play with the intention of increasing your rank. Now I'm honestly just treating it on like a per game basis. Like I don't really care what my rank is. Before it was like every account's got to get to GM and that's what I need to do every single season. Now I'm just like, I don't care. Like the absolute unit account, I've played in it quite a lot this season, and it's like <sighs> It's like low master or something. It's like, I think it might even be in diamond at the moment, but it's like, hey, whatever. I go into a game. If my team want to just play all DPS, well, I can't really do anything about that, even if I play tank or support. So it's not great. And one of the issues I've got as well is when you look at new games that come out, so uh, Call of Duty Black Ops is out now. Um, the blackout mode is really fun. And you can drop into that and play it. You look at games like Fortnite, you can drop into it and play it. Now, I'm not saying Overwatch players go and play Fortnite or Call of Duty or whatever, but... They are games that you cannot deny you will get your sort of time's worth out of them. Whereas Overwatch Competitive, you go into it and you're at the sort of mercy of your team. Are they going to be good? You know, so any kind of system which is going to allow us to put a team together. And when I mean good, I just mean actually a team. Like, I don't mind losing an Overwatch if we've got a team that works. But what I don't like is if we've got... Because you, you can tell straight away, right? If you've got somebody on your team who is filling because they know you need a main tank, right? And you lose the first fight, so they're like, screw this, and they just swap to Genji, or they swap to Pharaoh, or they swap, they just go straight back to the hero that they wanted to play. That's typical of Overwatch, because those players are like, okay, I'll try my best, but then instead of playing the tank or the role that they've selected, they're looking at it from a DPS point of view, and they're like, well, I would have killed those two guys. This guy's so bad, so I'm just going to play DPS. Now, what they do, or what they've done there, is thrown the game. They don't realize it because they think, I'm going to try and hard carry. But without a tank, you're never going to win. It's, it's This is like, it's so complicated, isn't it, Overwatch? Oh, my Lord. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, there's also another little kind of <laughs> thing I want to touch on here, and this is Farah. A lot of players have been saying Farah is trash, or Farah is not going to be very good when the update comes out. Now, me and Josh made a video on Farah, and we were a bit perplexed why they'd even bother touching Farah on PC. On console, I agree, because it makes, you know, you have to be more accurate. Um, you're not getting a lot of splash damage and just wiping people out all over the place, so that makes sense. But why put this onto PC? Well, you guys have been watching footage in the background here of me playing on Farah. Now, I'm not the best Farah player, but if you play Farah very 
very aggressively like a dive style ladder farrow, not like a pro level farrow. I'm talking like a hyper aggressive. You're gonna jump towards people and just shoot them at point blank range. She is so much more effective now, it is insane. If enemies wanna stand in a choke and you fire rockets into them, you do so much damage to them now, you can burn tanks down really quick. I still think you're generating your ultimate slower because you're not getting all that additional splash damage, but you're killing targets. It's more effective damage. So it's a really weird one. If you play Farah like a pro Farah, who generally it operates in the skybox firing at range, this is because they know the hit scan is really good and the hit scan will target you and kill you at that level, right? So they play at massive range firing away, or maybe they take a duel with the other Farah. That's kind of all they do. This Farah right now isn't as good as that old Farah for that kind of play but she's much stronger in other areas. And I think she rewards even more so, like ludicrous Farrah, I'm just gonna dive on top of people, I'm gonna jump in. Like if you guys have been watching the, the, the video in the background as I've been uh, talking about today's topics in the video, um, you'll notice that I'm sort of going between being really aggressive and sort of playing at range. This is because I'm bad. I should just be aggressive all of the time. You will get so many kills. This comes back to the idea of, well, of a, a certain sleeper characters in the game right now, Farrah, probably is one. Uh, Soldier, I'm working on a video for Soldier because Soldier is friggin' insane, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not joking. If you've got the accuracy now, you, you can just delete people with Soldier. McCree's stronger than he was before as well. But then we've got heroes like Sombra that people always look down on. She's mega strong. Mei is actually quite good right now. And Doomfist. But what I'll say about Mei and Doomfist, just to end this video, a lot of people out there are like, Doomfist is so, like, it's ridiculous to play against Doomfist. She just kills us. What the hell? Mei, it's the same, right? She just kills us. Those two heroes heavily punish players that do not play together. It doesn't matter what level you're playing at, if your team is not together, you will get killed by Mei, and you will definitely get killed by Doomfist. Doomfist will kill everybody 1v1, basically, or do so much damage to you, you have to get out of there. It's going to be very difficult to shut him down. So if the team's a mess, Doomfist can farm away. This is why you'll see Doomfist one tricks, Steam at the ladder, May one tricks. In fact, for a very long time, well, not for a very long time, but uh, I think for the last week or so, or, or, or at some point during last week, the top ranked player in the entire world was a May player. What's going on there? Anyway, that, that's because they just, they butcher teams that are not working together. And I don't mean some sort of high level synergy. I just mean playing together, like standing together. Don't run away. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I've been Stalo to this unit lost. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, then well, like the video. Remember, you can subscribe to the channel and uh, all of that good stuff. Follow me on Twitter, which is at Unit Lost Gaming. And I'm finally getting better. I'm not as bad, although I've got a massive headache, so I should probably go back to bed. Just catch you guys on the next one. <laughs> Doodly.